Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay coming to you from Baltimore. Max Blumenthal, well-known author, journalist, and regular contributor to The Real News Network, was also a staffer at the newspaper Al Akbar. Well, yesterday he resigned and he wrote a letter and the, the title of the article or letter of resignation is The Right to Resist is Universal, a farewell to Al Akbar and Assad apologists. Now joining us to talk about why he quit Al Akbar is Max Blumenthal. Thanks for joining us, Max. Thanks for having me. Uh, so what's, tell us the moment you were in. What, what kind of was the decision-making moment for you to quit Al Akbar? It's, Al Akbar is known as a fairly progressive newspaper, especially coming from the Arab world. It's not one of these sort of government publications the, or, or broadcasters that seems to dominate most of the Arab world. Uh, why did you quit? Well, I had noticed, uh, I started really paying attention to the coverage closely on the website and mainly the opinions uh, following the Hula massacre, which was by all accounts carried out by Shabiha, affiliated with the Assad regime, uh, to the embarrassment of the Assad regime. But I mean, it was part of their campaign of suppression inside Syria to crush uh, what I consider to be a legitimate um, attempt at removing a dictator. Um, and I noticed the opinions in favor of Assad had grown more strident on the website. Um, this was a point where, um, by all accounts, the Assad regime had killed as many as 10,000 people um, in order to remain in power, possibly 13,000, uh, according to people I know inside Syria who've come out. I've done extensive interviews um, and during the past few weeks, um, partly prompted by my anguish about my own position as a staffer at Al-Akbar. Uh, the Assad regime was running a, an, uh, an institution of torture in prisons. Uh, possibly 100,000 people are in prison right now. And uh, this makes Israel look like uh, you know a champion of human rights. And at the same time, um, while there were dissident voices at the paper, um, while there were still some great writers and some really um, humanistic people working at Al Akbar, um, I noticed that it was publishing um, op eds by people like Amal Saad Khorayeb, who were just openly apologetic of the Assad regime, if not cheerleading uh, Assad as this kind of subaltern freedom fighter leading what she called a frontline resisting state, or Sharmin Narwani, the blogger who was nickel and diming civilian casualty counts, who was at blaming the victims of the Assad regime, and who um, was attacking uh, the International Press Corps for attempting to gain access to the scene of the Assad regime's crimes, um, which reminded me um, of the uh, Israeli government during Operation Cast Lead in Gaza when they banned reporters from Gaza. This just was really too much for me and I'd, I'd always felt like Al Akbar was the most courageous, one of the most courageous publications in the Arab world, certainly the freest, gave me more latitude than any paper in the United States to write about Palestine, to write about Israel and Palestine. Um, and still uh, remains, uh, in some respects, a valuable publication on a lot of issues, like, for example, the abuse of domestic workers inside Lebanon, which is a plague, um, and very few other publications report on. But for me, it was a personal decision. It was too much to have my name and reputation associated with open Assad apologists um, when the scale of atrocities had become so extreme. And when the editor-in-chief of Al-Akbar was offering friendly advice to Bashar al-Assad on the website of al-Akbar, al um, you know, painting him as this kind of genuine, earnest reformer who just needed to get rid of the bad men around him and cut out some of the rich oligarchs who happened to be his cousins. Uh, and, and then everything would be fine. That was ridiculous. Now, and now you, you do get this kind of support for Assad uh, for example, in Latin America, much of the, many of the Latin American countries, Bolivia, Venezuela, I believe Ecuador, I'll have to check on that, have, have, have not just opposed intervention, which is one position, but have also come to sort of a defense of Assad as being sort of an anti-imperialist. 
because uh, I, I think it's important to separate the two questions. Uh, you know, I, 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 let me ask you in the sense, but you don't have to, uh, uh, opposing Assad or supporting the Assyrian people's right to overthrow Assad certainly doesn't equate to some support for outside intervention. It, it doesn't have to. Let me come back to that and just make one more point, which is that um, in the past weeks, I had learned of a major exodus of key staffers at Al Akbar uh, over the Syrian issue. Um, this, you know, this issue exploded right after I joined Al Akbar to write about Israel Palestine and to cover foreign policy debates in Washington. So Syria wasn't my beat. The Arab world wasn't my beat. I didn't really anticipate writing about it or discussing it on the website, um, but. The um, conflict over Syria has divided the Lebanese left, and so the debates at Al Akbar really reflected the debates inside the Lebanese left. And what um, what it came to by this spring apparently was that uh, the the pro Assad faction, which saw him and his regime as an anti imperialist bulwark, um, had more or less won out. Although some dissident voices remained. Now, in my view. Um, you can't. It's it's a ridiculous contention to make that Assad um, is a legitimate anti-imperialist figure, just because there is, there are Western imperial designs on Syria doesn't make him a freedom fighter. It doesn't make him a legitimate anti-imperial um, figure. He was always been a self-interested autocrat. His regime has in fact offered. Uh, negotiations with Israel with no preconditions. They they allowed the U.S. to render um, terror suspects, including those who appeared to be completely innocent, to Syria for torture. Um, you know, and and at and the same time, the, the famous case of the Canadian Mahar Arar. Mahar Arar, right? And he was he was innocent. So Syria was doing these favors to the United States. But really, for me, it came down to the question of Palestine. Um, something I really care about and which I've committed myself to. Um, I don't claim to speak for any Palestinians. This is a personal choice for me. I mean, I, I'm speaking for myself, but knowing Syria's history with Palestine, for example, um, invading Lebanon to crush the uh, Palestinian national struggle taking place in cooperation with, with uh, the Lebanese left, uh, besieging the Tal al-Zatar camp and eventually uh, massacring its inhabitants um, with the approval of the United States. Um, th this is Syria's history, and it's not a history of standing in solidarity with Palestinians necessarily. It's well, a history the, 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 of that, acting in its own self-interest as any dictatorial regime or as any state does. And, you know, I think the left needs to move beyond looking to uh, state power as a means of advancing uh, what should be humanistic ambitions, especially in a time of worldwide revolt, not just in the Arab world, but in the United States and Europe against the austerity measures. How can, how can you uh, make apologies for a dictator in one country and then support people power in another country? Well, Similarly- the, Mac, Max, uh, the, 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 the counter argument some people will make is that there's a plan, certainly the Saudis are driving it, the Qataris to some extent, maybe equally to the Saudis, I don't know. Uh, the Americans, to some extent, it's hard to know exactly where they're coming down on this, but it looks like, at least, the U.S., the Saudis want another Libya. The, at the very least, the, they're, they're arming and encouraging forces within Syria that militarize the struggle uh, in a way that maybe it didn't have to be militarized, and those forces within the opposition creating a civil war, and in other words, creating the, the context, the pretext, for some kind of Libyan outside intervention. And so you get this argument within the left that in those conditions, the issue is simply to oppose that, not to go after Assad. How do you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, I won't disagree with anyone who makes those claims. It's clear the United States, Saudi Arabia, um, and even um, Israel, I mean, I've heard scandalous stories from uh, friends at working in Washington about the Syrian National Council and uh, who they've been meeting with. I mean, this is a really lousy organization, um, which is actually rejected by a lot of Syrian dissidents who spent time in Syrian prisons and who reject foreign intervention, like Michel Kilo. So 
Um, I, I think, you know, it's legitimate to report on uh, Western designs and Saudi designs on Syria and, and to expose them. Um, and it's important to uh, stand on the side of authentic Syrian dissidents who impose imperialism. But uh, to go beyond that and, and paint Assad, a, a character who's really at the helm of a regime that's ideologically hollow, that represents nothing beyond a fascistic security apparatus uh, married to, and sometimes literally in some cases, a rich neoliberal business class, is just beyond the pale for me. It crossed a red line, and I was seeing that increasingly um, in the opinion section at Al Akbar. It's why I made a personal decision to leave. Um, so they, I think they went beyond a legitimate critique right. of the Syrian opposition. And, and, and Max, what, where are you getting information from about what's really going on in Syria? Like at the Real News, you know, we've been almost, not, I mean, not staying away from the Syrian story. We, we've tried to give, contextualize it as best we can. Uh, you know, dealing both with the issue of the right of people to rebel against dictatorship and the, the, the various nefarious schemes of, of, of outside players to fish in troubled waters and create and take advantage of the crisis. But we haven't been doing a lot because we're not sure what's going on. We don't know what's a reliable source of information. So when anything specific happens, we don't know which claim to believe. And unless we had our own journalist there or somebody we really knew we could trust, we're kind of left doing next, not very much. Uh, where are you getting information from? Well, that's, that's something I tried to avoid, which is um, speaking with complete authority about what's happening on the ground or speaking with total certainty. I think certainty is an enemy in, of, of any um, intellectual clarity in a situation like this. I mean, we have to be probing, we have to be questioning, but I made a personal decision based on my own values um, and based on the accounts that I was getting from Syrian activists, from Syrian intellectuals, and from journalists I respect who have been inside Syria, who've been in Homs, who've been with the revolution in Syria. Um, and I, these are, I mean, these are people I trust, but I'm, I also think uh, criticism of the opposition with journalistic authority is completely legitimate. My problem was that the opinions um, at Al-Akbar's website um, in support of the Assad regime, which, which I've identified specifically by Amal Saad Khurayeb and Sharmin Narwani, and by the editor-in-chief, Ibrahim Al-Amin, were not based on any f journalistic fieldwork. They were based on poring over YouTube clips, looking at textbooks, or um, I've really disturbing uh, citations by Amin of uh, anonymous regime sources including uh, documents that he cited, which um, he referred to as investigations of people detained for uh, trafficking weapons. And I, I asked if those investigations um, referred to interrogations, um, which, you know, is really disturbing to me. So I think it's important to uh, rely on journalistic, on, on journalistic work to consider that Yes, journalists often have their own agenda, especially if they come from the United States and don't really understand the Arab world, don't know much about Syria. But uh, I, trust, I trusted the people who I spoke to who'd been inside the country, who'd been on the ground much more than uh, I trust a bunch of YouTube clips right. or uh, people who are speaking purely um, from an ideological point of view and trying to fit everything the regime does into a Procrustean bed. Um, and so that's, that's my perspective. And it was really a personal piece that I wrote about disassociating myself from apologists for a dictator um, in the context of the universal right to resist. Now, now Ma Max, uh, some of the criticism you're getting is that you do write for other publications uh, some of which are not nearly as critical, for example, of Israel as Al Akbar allows you to be, and others that write for Al Akbar. Um, that uh, the, the question is, why didn't you just write what you wrote and see if Al Akbar would would publish it, but without resigning? What, why do you feel necessary ne necessary to quit? Why couldn't you fight it out there? I didn't. Um, I didn't think that. 
I, I don't doubt that they would have allowed me to fight it out there. Um, Al-Akbar is, remains a very free publication. As I said, more free than most in the Arab world and many in the United States and more progressive than many in the United States on the question of Palestine and on a lot of other issues. And they cover issues like ethnic minorities in Turkey or the abuse of domestic workers in Lebanon that U.S. publications don't cover. So there's still value to the website. For me, it was a personal decision, and it's true. Um, Assad Abu Khalil made some good points in his critique of my decision. Um, I don't agree with them all, but I might have created a quandary for myself because I've set the bar so high um, that many U.S. publications can't meet this bar. He um, used the example of me writing for the Huffington Post, which I think is comparing apples and oranges. The Huffington Post represents practically nothing. Um, beyond, uh, at this point, you know, uh, some news, some good analysis, um, but mostly softcore celebrity porn. Um, and and uh, I haven't written for the site since, uh, a lot, since the Writers Guild started striking against it because they weren't paying their writers. I understand that the picket is over and I could write for it again. But I don't really write for it. And it's also not a mag uh, an outlet that focuses on the Middle East like Al-Akbar does. So Al-Akbar is supposed to represent something. And for me, it was coming to represent increasingly through the dominant pro-Assad tone in its um, opinion section, something that I couldn't attach my name and reputation to specifically because my beat was Israel-Palestine and foreign policy debates in Washington. I couldn't continue to provide cover for the other writers as long as they were there. Assad Abu Khalil has said, um, you know, he blogs at the Angry Arab, uh, which is an essential blog. He said that, you know, it's a work in progress and I should have waited. I couldn't make any excuses any longer. I couldn't wait any longer to leave. Uh, I needed to wash my hands of the whole operation, but I won't begrudge anyone who wants to uh, joust with these Assad apologists on the site. I, it was something I personally couldn't do, and I am looking uh, to move to a higher ground, and and uh, we'll see if I get there. All right. Well, thanks very much for joining us, Max. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us on the Real News Network. And don't forget, we're in the midst of our uh, fundraising spring summer fundraising campaign. Every dollar you give will be matched until we reach a hundred thousand dollars. Thanks again for joining us on the Real News Network.